So this week, we have the privilege of hearing from Mike Mon, who first and foremost is a good friend of mine and a good friend of my wife. Uh, you guys knew each other in Boston. in Boston, yes. So I became friends with Mike um, through my wife, who was friends with Mike in graduate school. Um, and so uh, we have become great friends, and he's a wonderful person. So that's the first qualification for having Mike come and visit us. Beyond that, Mike has one of the most interesting career trajectories or kind of careers of anyone that I know. And the best way I can describe this is just my understanding of Mike's career is that he does interesting stuff for the company Qualtrics which I'm sure you've all heard of. But when I heard of Qualtrics, I was like, oh, it's just this company that does survey research. But Mike does like all sorts of other interesting and really awesome things through this company Qualtrics. So I'm hoping that you get to hear all about that. Um, he has lots of stories uh, about all sorts of fun and interesting places that he has been and people he's met and initiatives that he's started. Um, and I'll let him talk about all of those. Um, but it's uh, a real pleasure to have Mike here. So please um, welcome Mike Mon from Qualtrics. You guys, it's so uh, good to be here with you today. It's so good to be at BYU. Um, it's a great place. Really fast. So are you all, I have to use this the right? Yeah, okay. Yeah. I'm going to be obedient. Um, are you all political science majors then? No. What are you? Biology, anybody else? Accounting. Accounting, God bless you. Are you guys doing the Mac? Uh, I don't know yet. Oh, it's like a TBD, okay. So a couple of accounting, biology, anybody else? Do you take his wife's class, isn't she biology? No, chemistry. Chemistry, but chemistry. I do sorry. Chemistry. Mm. It's all science to me. Okay, and the rest of you are poli-sci? Okay, I did not do poli-sci. Uh, but thrilled to be here with you all. So um, I'll just, I don't know if I'm doing this right, but I think I'm doing it right. So if you're bored, just raise your hand and tell me to keep going. Uh, I'm just going to walk you a little bit through my career journey and then sort of a day in the life and then share a few principles that I believe will be useful in your careers. And then we'll take any questions you want to ask. Um, oh, it's St. Pa <laughs> Patrick's Day. Happy St. Patrick's Day. Um, the first section was basically uh, BYU, the world, and Congress. So while I was at BYU, um, every <laughs> I was skinnier. Um, while I was at BYU, every summer I would go spend in a foreign country. So after my sophomore year, I went and lived down in Guatemala and El Salvador, working with uh, street kids and then um, small business development in the Mayan Highlands. My after my junior year, went down to. Thailand to rebuild after the tsunami and after my first senior year um, I took a long time to get through school uh, I went down to Ghana and worked in uh, medical relief we, we pulled worms out of people uh, most days um, working on something called guinea worm so that was a huge piece of just how I structured my uh, education and worked a little bit in politics in the time as well interned in the US Senate for a senator named Bob Bennett um, through the Washington Seminar Program, had a great time there. Um, one of my family, does this have like a laser thing? Anyway, one of my family's best friends is this guy in the middle, Mike Levitt, who was governor of Utah for most of my life. He at the time was Secretary of Health and Human Services. That comes into the story later because I loved what he did with his career and watching him. Uh, he spent a lot of time in, in healthcare in the private sector and then went into healthcare related jobs in the public sector. And I thought that was a really great model and something that I thought I was going to follow, largely because Mike was a great example and, and mentor. Um, I didn't want to go be governor, but I did really like what he did, and that's why healthcare was a major piece of what I thought I was going to do. Obviously, I didn't do that. After BYU, um, I moved to Arizona. I did real estate development, developed uh, retail shopping centers, a lot of Walgreens, other stuff like that. So I spent four years uh, doing real estate development, loved every bit of it, but then felt like my brain was turning to mush 
and so decided to go back to grad school and try something else. So I did a joint degree at Northwestern at the Kellogg School of Management uh, and at Harvard at the Harvard Kennedy School. Um, so I spent a year in Chicago and then I did a semester in Boston, semester in Chicago, a year in Boston. They wanted you to cross pollinate the schools, stuff like that, so we just went back and forth a bunch. Um, went to both schools. While I was there, I, I hate this picture because I feel like it's cultural appropriation, but I couldn't find any other pictures. <laughs> While I was at Northwestern, a big thing that we focused on um, for, for a couple of years there was working on HIV AIDS issues, especially in resource limited settings. So spent uh, a bit of time down in Kenya um, and led a big project team where we looked at how to design medical devices and distribute them in settings where you don't have power all the time, or the power was really spotty. So how do you create these things? A lot of children, uh, especially at the time, were being born from HIV-infected mothers, and so how do you uh, diagnose the HIV quickly so that you can get them on antiretrovirals if you need to, but it's very damaging to get on them if a child, if you don't have them, so it was all, a lot of work we did there. Um, even during school, you can have lots of those opportunities. Um, I. I am a Republican, not by current standards, but at the Kennedy School, um, it was like a very rare thing. So I got an email that asked me to go speak at the forum. First time they'd had students speak there in like a decade uh, because I was, this is how messed up Harvard is, I'm just sharing with you. I was a diversity candidate as a conservative <laughs> white male. I am not joking. The email inviting me to speak said, we understand that you have come out as a Republican. Still have it to this day. Weirdest email I've ever gotten. Uh, so I spoke there. I then uh, dropped out of school for a time. Um, Mitt Romney's right-hand guy is a guy named Matt Waldrop. Matt and I are close friends. Uh, Matt kept asking me to do stuff for the campaign. Mitt was running for president at the time, so I dropped out of school eventually. Uh, worked full-time on the campaign on the legal team. Um, and our job was to help get Mitt on the ballot in all 50 states. Least glamorous job. We'll talk about that in a minute as well. Um, but great experience. Mitt would always come into our meetings and be like, look, if you're going to, we're in the Super Bowl of politics. And I always told everyone if I could play one football game in my life, you might as well play in the Super Bowl. I'll never do a campaign again. Uh, but it was really, really fun if you're going to do one campaign to do that campaign in the Super Bowl. Um, so I had a great time doing that. Uh, I don't know if you heard, but we lost. Um, and so I uh, went back to school, finished up, and then after that, I uh, decided to go to Qualtrics. I, the reason I did the joint degree is I really thought I wanted to go into healthcare, and I feel like to go into healthcare, it's incredibly valuable to have a deep understanding of both the policy side and the business side. And so uh, that was a huge piece for me. Let's go figure out both. Let's understand how they work. After two years of focusing on that, uh, I realized that for me, the healthcare side moves way too slowly. It's broken. It's I love efficiency. I love getting things done. I love moving fast, and that was never going to be a good industry for me. So it was a weird moment because I was like, wow, I just got a second degree solely for the purpose of going to healthcare. At that point, I had one year left at Kennedy, and I was like, this, this is not what I'm going to do now. But I couldn't not finish. So I, I, I don't regret doing it. Like, I love it. I love the experience that I had. I loved what I learned. Uh, for me, I would not have done the joint degree had I known where my career was going to go. You don't always know where your career is going to go. And even though I've gone into tech, and I'll show you here, I've done a ton of stuff and still do a ton of stuff in politics and with the political world all the time. So it still served me really, really well. It's just not a path I meant to go down. Yeah? What was your degree called again? Uh, well, it was just an MBA and a master's in public policy. So yeah, two, I mean, they're like separate, but they each counted one semester of the other's school. So. Um, at Qualtrics, I, oh, this just says we went to Qualtrics. At Qualtrics, we've done like a ton of different things. And uh, I don't know what I do, but like I, right now I lead the chairman's office. So a guy named Ryan Smith started Qualtrics with his dad and his brother. He was CEO forever when we went public. I guess that was a year ago when we went public last year. Ryan moved from CEO to chairman. He and I have worked so closely together over the last decade. Uh, that I decided to move with him. So I now lead the chairman's office. We backfilled my old role. He and I continue to, to do stuff together. We taught a class at the business school last semester um, and, and whatnot. So uh, we, we've done a ton of different stuff over the years. 
Um, and this will go to one of the lessons I want to share about your job. But uh, one thing we did, we helped Freakonomics start a new podcast, right? And then they merged that into Freakonomics Live. Here's, this is our first time we ever did it. We had uh, Malcolm Gladwell, Liz Wiseman, Tim Ferriss, Stephen Dubner, who wrote Freakonomics, and I. We launched this new thing. Now, what does that have to do with Qualtrics? I'm still not totally sure. Um, but what it did was it allowed us to get in front of 2 million people every single episode to get our name out there, right? So sometimes you go do these random things that don't necessarily fit what you're doing, but go for it. This is the Five for the Fight patch. So um, Ryan and I started this charity called Five for the Fight six years ago, uh, inviting everyone to give $5 for the fight against cancer. Five years ago, we decided to, the NBA changed their rules, and for the first time in their history, allowed you to put um, a patch on jerseys. So we negotiated this deal. Um, Qualtrics pays full price for it, but we decided to put, uh, donate it to our charity. Um, one, it was the right thing to do. Two, we're all in on defeating cancer. Three, strategically though, it was incredibly important because, um, for example, just press coverage, we got 14 times more press coverage than any other patch. 14X is an incredible return on a lot of patches that got a lot of press coverage, right? So it told our story, it helped everyone view us in a completely different light. It was a super risky move. Um, Ryan would sometimes call me at like two in the morning uh, in the weeks leading up to it and be like, are you sure? And I would tell him that like I was sure. And I'd hang up and I'd be like, I don't have a clue what I'm doing. <laughs> but sometimes you just have to have that conviction and finally, like a week or so before, it, one of those phone calls, are you sure? And I just kind of lost it. I said, dude, if we're going to do what everybody else is doing, we shouldn't do the patch at all. Like, it's incredibly boring. It's not going to work. I don't want to just do what everyone else is doing because that's dumb. Um, to Ryan's credit, he is willing to just bet on people who will bet on themselves. And uh, he just wanted to know that I had the conviction to stand behind this. Now, the day we announced the patch was February 13th. Um, day before Valentine's Day, I'll never forget. I've played sports my whole life. I've been in a highly competitive environment. Obviously not great anymore. Thanks for pointing that out. Um, but but uh, I've, I've never thrown up before. But before we went up to announce this, I was like, I could get fired this afternoon. If this thing bombs, we're dead. Uh, we announced it went really well, but I like literally ran to the bathroom because I thought I was gonna throw up. I was so nervous because I was like, I've been telling him I'm sure for a while. I have no idea what I'm doing. So sometimes you just have to take those leaps in the dark, right? So we started Five for the Fight. Because this is poli sci, I'm just showing you. I don't know if anybody remembers this. Mitt Romney made uh, worldwide news for mocking Russell Westbrook in the playoffs. We had made him this jersey. It says number five on it for Five for the Fight. He's donated a bunch of money to Five for the Fight. He's been a great supporter. I'm literally walking out of the office and the woman who runs Five for the Fight hands me this jersey that says Romney on the back. And she says, next time you see Mitt, will you give this to him? And I'm like, yes, I, it's not like I run into Mitt very often anymore. Anyway, I throw it in my backpack, go to the game. I walk out on, into our seats and I look over and there's Mitt Romney. And I was like, well, that's fortuitous. So I walk up to him and I'm like, hey, Gov, thanks for your support, blah, blah, blah. Here's this jersey we made for you. Next thing I know, he's put it on. It's like a double XL over his very Mitt Romney button down shirt. He then mocks Russell Westbrook. Again, it's all over CNN, Bleacher Report, everywhere you could imagine. And he's wearing a number five jersey. We had just traded Rodney Hood, who was number five, a few months before. So every paper in America and the world is mocking Mitt for wearing a jersey for a player that doesn't play for the team anymore. And I spent that entire day calling every news outlet in America on Mitt's behalf, correcting the story that I gave him the jersey, that he's supporting cancer research. He was running for Senate at the time. His Senate opponent, like, going to town on him on Twitter. I'm getting all these phone calls like, hey, we need you to take care of this. This is your fault. So this is our fun Mitt Romney meme. Now you know the backstory if any of you cared. But that's how it all happened. Um, with what we do, we get to, with Qualtrics, do a bunch of stuff in the community. This is with the bottom picture with the UN uh, Secretary for the UN Foundation. Um, do a ton with politics all the time. So this is an event we held at my house. Um, still do a ton of work abroad, like you still, in your career, there's tons of opportunities. So I sit on three boards, Five for the Fight, uh, Utah Jazz Foundation, and the Walesa Bugu Foundation. Do a lot of that work. Um, get to work with a lot of amazing people. This is Vladimir Klitschko, uh, world heavyweight boxing champion, uh, incredible guy. 
his brother is the mayor of Kiev. Uh, he and his brother are both there in Ukraine uh, fighting every day right now. Uh, this guy could do anything in the world worth a bajillion dollars. Uh, very rich, very famous, very powerful. Um, and so you also get to know people in, in very real situations um, and, and their struggles as well. Um, we do a lot of work with Encircle, uh, um, supporting LGBTQ youth. Um, and then uh, one thing that we've tried to do since we took over the jazz year ago is just bring more people to Utah um, and help people see that what they think of Utah is maybe not Utah's reality. Uh, Jared Hess is a, a wonderful person, dear friend of mine. He did uh, Napoleon Dynamite, um, uh, Nacho Libre, but his most recent was Murder Among the Mormons. And I'm like, Jared, this is not super helpful because everybody watches this and they see 1980s Mormons dressed in basically pioneer bonnets, and that's still what they think of as Utah. So a big thing we've been trying to do is help people see that Utah is a, a wonderful, welcoming uh, place um, with a great and vibrant tech scene, a great and vibrant education scene, great and vibrant economy, um, and stuff like that by hosting people at jazz games and whatever. One of my favorite thi things that I've been able to do, oh, can you just push play in a second? Who's, is someone still here doing that? Or do I push play? I can do it. I'm glad you are excited because you should be. You deserve it. For each win this season, the Utah Jazz are providing a full scholarship to a student from an underrepresented group. That's four years of tuition, room and board, books, fees, everything. And after selecting the first 30 scholarship recipients, we had a few special guests help us share that life-changing news. I had to call and let you know, man, that you got the scholarship, you got the Utah Jazz Scholarship, and I wanted to be the first to congratulate you, man. And I wanted to congratulate you on being selected for the Utah Jazz Scholarship. You're joking. Not at all, man. I just want to say congratulations. You've been chosen to receive the Utah Jazz Scholarship. Are you it's all yours, congratulations. <laughs> yeah, no cap. You're lying. No, I promise you, You're I wouldn't. Lying. I would. I would never lie to you. You've been selected for the scholarship, so. No, you're joking. You're lying. Hey man, I'm telling you, I won't lie to you, bro. You got it. You've been chosen to receive the Utah Jazz Scholarship, bro. Congratulations. <laughs> Congratulations. That's. Amazing news. This is actually pretty awesome to have Rudy telling me this. The sky is the limit. Keep soaring, keep keep being you, and, and keep striving for greatness. No, I'm really, really impressed. So I know everyone is, and continue, continue to do that. Go and tell your mom. And I told her to be quiet, because you know. Now you can. Ah! <laughs> oh my God, thank you. Thank you so much. I really appreciate the opportunity. Thank you. Yeah. Oh. Thank you so much. It means so much to me. Yo, thanks, man. Congratulations. That's big time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead. All right. All right. Yo. So uh, that's one of my favorite things we've been able to do. Um, when when George Floyd was murdered uh, last year. It really ignited a huge conversation about race, about issues um, faced by members of underrepresented groups and minority communities. One thing that we wanted to make sure we did at Qualtrics and with the jazz is not just simply make a statement. A lot of great organizations made statements that I think are important, um, way more important than that is taking action. Uh, we didn't want to take action that was kind of one and done. And so as we thought, thought through what can we do and what can we do to have an immediate impact today? We said we want to do something for every single win. So that every time the Jazz play, every time we win a game, people are reminded again of how important this is and how important the causes are uh, that we can continually dedicate ourselves to. And, and very few things in life has, have as big an impact as education. And so when we launched the Utah Jazz Foundation and Utah Jazz Scholarship, that's where we said for every win the Jazz have, we'll provide a scholarship to someone from an underrepresented group. 90% uh, of our scholars are first generation college students, 54% are women. Um, all of them uh, have demonstrated financial need, all of them um, uh, are, are just, anyway, amazing kids. So last Saturday, 
Uh, we brought them all to the jazz game, they and their families, um, introduced them to all these players that had called them to tell them about the scholarship. We lied to them all and said that they were having an interview. It was not an interview, it was a jazz player FaceTiming them to tell them, that's why they're all surprised. Um, anyway, so this is just from Saturday, we had them all come. Uh, most of the players came out, met with them, this is them with Donovan. Um, the Jazz have had 105 wins so far, so we're uh, in April we'll award another 60 to 70 scholarships and then we'll do the remainder the, the coming year. Um, that I'm supposed to give you a day in the life, so I'm just giving you yesterday to again show you while I work for a tech company, mostly we do tech stuff. We sell, uh, we just hit a billion dollars in revenue. Uh, a very tech heavy job, but while I never expected it going to the Kennedy School, literally just yesterday all morning with Major League Soccer. We just bought the uh, Real Salt Lake, uh, so the, the soccer team there. Then I went to an executive advisory board uh, meeting for the First Lady of Utah. I sit on her board. Uh, so we met mostly to talk through Ukraine and Utah for Ukraine and all the things that we're doing there right now with the board meeting. Then I met with the PGA Tournament to go through a bunch of stuff we can do to, for them on using Qualtrics, getting feedback, improving the player experience, the sponsor experience, the, uh, all of that. Then I met with Michelle Obama's team. Uh, we're flying out there in two weeks to sit down with Michelle um, for an event that we're doing. And we hosted a bunch of people at the jazz game and then like literally got a text and I was like, this fits to go to lunch with all these governors, right? So the point is my, my life still, while I, while I didn't go into politics, I didn't study poli-sci per se, um, I think in most jobs you still find you end up doing a lot of stuff, especially if you are, are a business leader in, in some capacity. You'll always be intersecting with political science, even if you don't go into that as your job. So that's been my experience. And, and again, if I knew that I was not going into healthcare, I would not have done the joint degree and done the Kennedy program. That said, having done it, uh, it's been a huge benefit and blessing and I use all the stuff um, all the time. So I'm going to end with these five points. I'm just looking to Mike to see, if, or Professor Barber, to see if I'm doing this right. Um, here, here are just five lessons that I'm trying to learn. I'm going to walk you through each of the five. Um, I don't pretend that I've learned any of them, but here are five lessons I'm trying to learn. Um, you manage your own career. No one will manage it for you. I think you will find as you go into the workplace, there are always a lot of people who uh, will get frustrated with their position and, and be like, they just don't understand how much value I have to add, or they don't know how much I can do, or they don't know what they've got in me, right? Well, no one's responsible to manage your career but you. So go aggressively get your needs met. Make it very clear. Don't expect someone to read your mind and, and try to understand what you want to have happen. Uh, it's up to you to articulate that. It's up to you to make sure you're communicating that. It's up to you to make sure that people around you know that uh, and that you demonstrate that. I put this picture up of Pam from the office. I know that's a dumb example, but there's a point in the show where Pam has gone from receptionist to salesperson and she hates sales. And there's a gentleman who comes in asking for the office manager three days in a row. On the third day, Pam just decides, I'm the office manager. So she goes up to him and she's like, I'm the office manager. And then she just starts telling everyone she's the office manager until she gets the job office manager. Dumb example, but she, she got her needs met. She managed her own career. I'll tell you the story of two people uh, that, I, that I had on my team for a long time. One of them, uh, incredibly good at her day job. You could hand her anything and she would just crush it. And I would hand her a project or, or some task or, or assignment, and I would never think about it again because I knew she was going to do an amazing job of it. Now, she was very ambitious, and she would come to me and say, I want to try that. I want to do this. Like, let's go do that. To me, because she was so good at her day job, that looked like ambition, and I loved it. I would break down any wall for her. I'd give her any opportunity she ever asked for because she was really good at her day job, which meant I could trust her with anything else. There was another person on the team who was not great at their day job and wouldn't focus on what we needed done. Not a great team player and was always looking, can I do that? Can I try that? Can I try that? Well, in that instance, it looked a lot like distraction. So here it looked like ambition and here it looked like distraction. Because 
people will trust you with whatever you want to do so long as you're also doing what the team needs to have done, done. If you're really good at getting those things done, then you give yourself license and you give your boss and other people license to open up a lot of doors for you. But if you're always looking for something else and not doing the thing that needs to be done, it looks like distraction and it's very hard for you to want to, to open doors for that individual because they're not playing uh, as part of the team. So that's number one, manage your own career. No one will manage it for you. I promise, I, I promise this is true. I just write this down and keep it forever. Two rules of successful careers, demonstrate impact and show initiative. This is my best attempt at demonstrating impact. I don't know, guys. Um, demonstrate impact, show initiative. What I mean by that is uh, you get resumes all the time. Um, that will just tell you the job description. You had your job description the first day you took the job. That doesn't tell me anything about how well you did it. I'm very grateful that you're responsible for these seven things, but I don't know how you did at those seven things. So demonstrate impact, and, and that's almost always quantifiable. Uh, what people want to see is that you can quantify the contribution that you've had to the company you increased the revenue by x percent or you decreased costs by this or you increased the speed at which something had happened or you whatever right demonstrate impact because then both you and they know what's going on one failure i had early in my career at qualtrics i remember i was working so we got bonus quarterly back then so you you would get instead of an annual bonus quarterly bonus at the end of the quarter and I'd been working, I'd come in super early. I was in by, well, I don't, it doesn't matter. I was in really early. I'd stay till 10, 11, 12, 1 a.m., whatever. I was working very hard. At the end of the quarter, I remember we sat down and I was like trying to say what I'd done. And I literally had no idea what I'd done. I couldn't show any impact. And I vowed never to fail like that again because I was working hard. And Neil Maxwell, uh, and a former apostle, used to always say, uh, talk about, this is back in where you could say these words, he talked about a Mormon malaise going nowhere but very anxiously. Like that's what I felt like I was, I must have done because I couldn't tell you the impact I had that quarter, but I, I worked really hard. I went nowhere but very anxiously. And so as you get into your careers, it will be very easy to just do a lot of what I call maintenance tasks. There are a million things that I do every day that just someone has to do. I'm not getting any credit for them. I'm not, and I, who cares about credit? But it's not, it's not taking us somewhere. But like last night, we had a bunch of people come into a jazz game, and I had to figure out who's sitting with whom and who's Ryan sitting with, who am I hosting, where do these other people go? Dwayne Wade called and had some guests there. We got to take care of them. That does not move the business forward. That's not demonstrating impact. It's just something that had to be done, right? Those are maintenance tests. Those will always come. You just can't let that overwhelm you. And so you have to be very clear with yourself about come hell or high water, by the end of this quarter, I will have achieved these four things. A million other things I'm going to also have to do, but these are the four things I will have accomplished so that you can always look back and say at the end of the quarter or end of the year, end of the semester, this is the impact that I had. The second piece is initiative. Again, you have your job description the day you start. What I, what I always want to see, and what I always try to do, lesson I'm trying to learn, right, is, is how do you demonstrate initiative to see things other people didn't? To look at a process and say, can we do this better or more efficiently? Or is there a new program we can start? Not just, don't start things to just start things. It's very stupid. Uh, Ukraine, big issue right now, right? A lot of people are trying to start their own foundations. Uh, one thing we just did is we, we donated 32,000 nights of stays through airbnb.org. There's already someone who's figured out a really great thing to do. So we're just going to go do that. You don't have to invent your own thing every time. That said, take initiative to not just do your job, but figure out what the goal is and then figure out the best way to get there. Because if you just always do it the way it's been done, you're never going to get better. You're never going to totally change the game. So that's what I always look for when I'm interviewing people. That's what I, I hope I'm always trying to do, is how can I take initiative to start uh, some new thing, to do something better, not just do the job they gave me. Um, 
third piece, lighting fires is always better than putting them out. Um, in your job, you will always get more credit when you can pour fuel on a fire than when you're the person putting out fires. Putting out fires is something that has to happen, but that means something went wrong, and I compare that a little bit to being an accompanist. It's a little bit like my job was with Mitt Romney. Not a little bit. It's exactly like my job was with Mitt Romney. I, was, I, was, I loved the campaign. It was great. But that was not a job that was gonna, ever going to get me anywhere. The, the story we were telling in that campaign is that Mitt Romney was the only adult at the table. Nobody else could get on the ballot in every state because they just weren't even organized, right? Newt, Newt Gingrich missed a bunch of states. Rick Santorum missed a bunch of states, blah, blah, blah. We were the only ones doing that. So my job was huge downside, no upside. It's like being an accompanist. If you play the piano really well while that individual is singing, nobody notices you are there at all. If you mess up, everyone's like, holy, did you hear the accompanist? Right? Same thing with Mitt Romney. If I'd missed a single state, if our team had missed a single state, it would have been in every newspaper in the world that our whole narrative, that we were the only adult in the room, only person that could get our act together, only person that uh, every newspaper in the world would have covered the fact that we missed a state. If we nailed every state, nobody cared. Don't take a job like that. It's, you never get as much credit for putting out fires as you do for lighting them. So anything to deal with revenue, anything to deal with growth, anything to deal with like new opportunities, helping build something, you'll always get more credit for those types of things. That doesn't mean that both jobs don't need to be done, but always ask yourself, in this role, am I adding fuel to the fire that's gonna get us where we're going? Or am I just the person that goes and puts out fires every time there's uh, something going poorly? Um, again, it's not that you do either or. Sometimes you, most people have to do both, but I would just make sure that those are parts of your jobs and how you look at it. I know these are contradictory things. Life is long and the world is big. Life is short and the world is small. Um, life is long and the world is big. What I mean by that is, is sometimes, especially uh, millennials and, and Gen Z, have this, uh, and we've done a lot of research on this, I'm not just parroting stereotypes, but have this idea that we have to like be at the top tomorrow or we failed, right? Like life's long. You're gonna have tons of opportunities. You're gonna be able to see a lot of things. You'll, you'll experience a ton of stuff. So, so don't be too impatient. If it takes a few years to go work in a job where you're not the boss, but you're learning from incredible people, right? Um, and the world is big. Don't sp I, I cannot emphasize this enough. Don't spend one minute of your time with toxic people or in a toxic work environment. There's always another job, and there's always another boss, and there's always another team. If you're ever asked to do something unethical or that doesn't sit right with you or work with people who are not worth spending any time with, just get out. There's another rocket ship, another unicorn, another senator's office, wherever you want to work. But life is way, and the world is way too big to spend any time with toxic people. Just, or, or in situations where you feel you have to compromise any of your own ethics, get out of there as fast as you can. Life is short and the world is small. The, the thing here is the world is a really small place. And we'll get into this on, on the next one, I think. Um, but it's, it's really important to uh, just be kind to people. It's shocking how many people I was a freshman in college with. We're all in our same freshman ward in the same freshman dorms over at Helaman Halls. We all, a bunch of us met up again in grad school. We all went to the same grad schools. A bunch of us now work here in the tech community. And you know if people were not good people or not someone's good to work with or whatever, um, not that you hold that against people, but just be a good human being. Like, the world's really small. When I first moved to Utah, uh, I took a job at Qualtrics. We had 300 people. We had one office in Provo, Utah. And uh, I was at something, met some guy there. We were eating lunch randomly at this event. Um, very rude, very dismissive, very kind of like, oh, so sad that you work at a dumb place like Qualtrics. Fast forward three years, I'm interviewing him for a job because he's looking for a job, and I am not going to hire him. Not out of a personal vendetta, but I just want to work with good people. 
life's way too short to work with people who are unkind to other people based on the position they think they have at the time. Uh, and frankly, some days you're up and some days you're down, so treat everybody well, right? Um, but, but people will, will never forget leaders like Zelensky, right? Um, do I have one more? This is the last one, right? Okay. This is, this is maybe my favorite thing, and then whatever questions you want to ask, if you have questions or we can just leave early. Um, work hard and be kind and amazing things will happen. So I have two, two brief stories here. Uh, the first is from my brother. There's a bunch of suits. My, when my brother was 11 or so years old, he was um, out shopping with my grandfather. And my grandfather was a fairly well-known person in the community. And he was standing off somewhere else, and they were at Mr. Mac grabbing some suits. And I guess my brother was being a bit of an 11-year-old, right, and just like messing around with the suits. And the worker came, and, and again, same kind of story, was very, very mean to my brother, treated him quite poorly, um, not super nice. Fast forward like three minutes, and my grandfather walks over, and this guy sees that my brother is with him, and starts being insanely friendly, like overly friendly, treats my brother like a completely different human being. And that moment has stuck with my brother for ever. He's now an executive Fortune 200 company and, and whatever, and, and he thinks about that all the time. He keeps a little plaque underneath his desk that only he can see, basically reminding him of this moment buying suits. Um, and the point being that when when that guy thought my brother was just some random kid, he treated him really poorly. When he saw who my brother was affiliated with, he treated him really differently. And my brother's like, that's not the kind of person that I want to be. So he keeps that little sign under his desk to remind him all the time to treat everybody well, no matter who they are, um, because we're all worthy of being treated well. The second uh, piece of this story is Conan O'Brien. So Conan O'Brien, um, I've literally never watched a show of Conan O'Brien's except this day. And uh, Jay Leno was number one in late night. They fired Jay Leno and hired Conan O'Brien. He came in to be, um, I don't know what they call it, to be the host of, of the late show, late of the Tonight Show, excuse me, to be the host of the Tonight Show. He had the job for seven months and his ratings dropped precipitously compared to David Letterman. It had been Letterman and Leno forever. Now it's the two Jimmys. Um, and so they fire Conan O'Brien and bring Jay Leno back. And uh, Conan O'Brien, uh, this was his final night as host of The Tonight Show, which had been his dream his entire life. What, do you have a dream job? State you, want, you want to be Secretary of State? Sure. Perfect. You and Anthony Blinken. Um, Tony's got a very hard job right now. Think if you got to be the Secretary of State. You finally get your dream job. Do you have a dream job? Yeah. I don't either. God bless you. We'll figure it out. Um, he gets his dream job. He's waited his whole life, worked everything to get this moment. He gets fired after seven months. Very public. Everybody know he got fired, right? So he stands up there on his last day. And I sign a lot of contracts with, with famous people just because of some of the events we do and whatever. Um, I'm very familiar. Most of them have something called a non-disparagement clause. You can't say anything bad. W when we signed the deal with the Jazz, we now own the Jazz, but it was different. We signed the deal with the Jazz. In that deal, sponsoring the patch for the jersey, we said that we will never speak ill of the Jazz <laughs> as an organization. They all have these non-disparagement clauses in them, right? Conan stands up on his last day and says that he has negotiated into his final contract. They're buying him out millions of dollars in his final final contract. He's negotiated into his contract that he can say whatever he wants about NBC that night. I guarantee he had to give up a lot of money to get rid of the non-disparagement clause in his contract for that one night. So he says to the audience, I have negotiated this in that I can say whatever I want about NBC tonight. I'm sure every NBC executive is watching very carefully to see what is Conan gonna say. Because again, if you're willing to give up, he never said how much, but if you're willing to give up a few million dollars to be able to say whatever you want and not have a non-disparagement clause, I'm gonna be a little nervous for what he's gonna say. And this is what he said. Thank you. He said, thank you for the greatest honor 
of my life. It's every comedian's dream to host The Tonight Show, and I got that opportunity, and I'll be grateful every day that I got to do this for the past seven months. It was so important to him that everyone knew that was sincere, that he had negotiated out the non-disparagement clause so that he could say thank you. And then he continued and said this, work hard and be kind and amazing things will happen. And I've loved that. I, again, I've never watched Conan before. I've never watched him since. I've seen a few clips here and there. Work hard and be kind and amazing things will happen. I think that, above all else, is the best advice I could give anyone in their career. Um, if you work hard and are a good human being, people that people want to work with, uh, a kind person who does really great work, uh, there's no limit to what you can go do. And people will give you opportunities. More importantly, you'll create amazing opportunities and have a lot of amazing experiences throughout your life. That's all I have. If you have questions, happy to answer them. If you don't, Happy to buy us all rubber or something. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, okay. Let's do let's do some questions. So I'll I'll just run the mic around this time since I'm holding it in my hand. Who has questions? I have a question. So if somebody here wants to work at Qualtrics, what's what does Qualtrics look for? What types of jobs are there for people coming right out of college? Oh, awesome. We have two mics. Literally. Two mics, <laughs> holding two mics. Um, Qualtrics has basically every role out there now, right? So if you want to do uh, sales, engineering, support, like customer support, customer success, um, marketing, PR, all those things. Um, what are they looking for? I think, you know, they'll look for initiative and impact always. Uh, they want to see, obviously, you guys are in college, so that you've done some internships or, or have some, uh, shown some interest, at least, or aptitude for, for some of those roles. But there's not a massive requirement for you have to have experience to do all these things, right? Um, to enter our, what we call CUNY, Qualtrics University, which is sort of the feeder for most of the company, outside of sales. Uh, they, they expect some level of coding um, expertise, not software engineering at all, but an understanding and aptitude for that, uh, which is why I did not go that direction. Um, and then sales, uh, they usually look and see, it's more helpful if you've sold in some environment. Uh, many people have had some relevant experience on a mission that, that can be useful there as well. Um, a, a big thing that I think is really important at this point, Clay Christensen, who I'm sure you're all familiar with, Clay talked a lot about deliberate and emergent strategies. Emergent strategies be early in your career. Uh, try a lot of different stuff. That's why we do a lot of internships while we're in undergrad. Um, uh, but try a bunch of different stuff. See what fits for you. And early in your career, you should probably bounce and try a bunch of different things. Um, and then kind of buckle down with a deliberate strategy once you're there. But I think it's a uh, lot of, lot of uh, places like Qualtrics would love to see some uh, emergent type of experience on your resume in order to show us that you've looked at different stuff. Awesome. Other questions? Could you just talk a little bit more about how you got started at Qualtrics and maybe how you got to know Ryan and what you were doing early on? Yeah, um, I met uh, Ryan in the interview process. I didn't know him um, before. When I got hired, um, we were just launching our employee experience business. And so uh, the rest of the company was kind of located together. Um, we owned two floors of a building shortly after we moved to the third floor and we put engineering, support, sales, and um, maybe that was it. And then two of us who were kind of leading that team. And then Jared Smith, Ryan's brother. We all sat together, co-located in the business to kind of run our own startup within a startup. So it was awesome because we were running our own business, but we didn't have to worry about payroll or accounts receivable or any of those things because we we're part of Qualtrics. So did that for the first year, year and a half to get that business kind of up and running. We relaunched a product that we had there 
um, started a new product line um, and had a great time. Uh, after we'd been at it a little over a year, they were moving that business, integrating it into Qualtrics. And so our sales team was moving back into the sales org. Our support team was moving in with the best rest of support. Um, I decided that I, and, and my role would have turned into sort of a traditional product marketing role, which I had no interest in. Um, so I shared with them that I said by December, I'll have a new job. And that can be here or that can be somewhere else, but I don't want to do this anymore. Um, at the same time, we'd had a big shift in our uh, marketing organization. The head of marketing had left. We're bringing in a new marketing person. They sat me down and asked me if I would run PR for the company. And I said, no, I have no interest in doing that. I said, what's the job that you need done? And they said, well, we need to go grow global demand for our brand. I said, cool, if you're going to do that, I think that needs public relations, analyst relations, social media, corporate social, I, all those different things, sponsorships, da 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 da. Um, and I said, that's a job I'll take, but I'm not just going to go do the one. Uh, they came back and said, great, fine, go, go do that role. Um, and so I did that. Uh, in the course of that, um, honestly, like life is full of a bunch of random moments. Um, that looking back makes sense, but there were two, I think, big moments where Ryan and I started working together. One was um, his CEO coach at the time was a woman named Kim Scott, uh, who was an executive at Apple um, and at Google, and she was the CEO coach for the CEOs of Twitter, Dropbox, Qualtrics, whatever, and a uh, bit of a Silicon Valley legend. And we were on the phone with her one day talking about uh, an event we were having. She would come speak. And it was just Ryan and I and Kim. And I kept like interjecting, like, oh, let's do something different, or let's try this, or try that. And Ryan looked at me kind of weird. And then he left and said he had to go to the bathroom. And Kim and I just kept talking and then came back in and he left again. And it wasn't until a few months later that he said, I've he said, every time I sat in those meetings before, nobody talked but me. Like everyone just sat against the wall and was quiet. He said, you were the first person. He's like, you were his words, but he was like, that was Kim freaking Scott. Like nobody's willing to whatever, right? But I, I don't know. I didn't view it that way. I just was like, let's get the job done. But I think that was the first time you realized here's someone who could give me enormous leverage and can carry on conversations with whomever. But that I couldn't have scripted that. I didn't mean to do that. You know what I mean? Um, and then there was one other moment where it was like 8 p.m. and I was trying to figure out how to grow our employee experience business. Uh, we had no thought leadership. Every other competitor we had had blogs and authors and PhDs and we were a bunch of kids trying to make stuff up. Um, and so I was like, hey, we should write a book together and let's like do this so we can put out some thought leadership. And he's like, okay, let's, let's we never did by the way. But he's like, let's start meeting. And so when we started meeting, Every week to talk through ideas, we started writing a bunch in Forbes and Fortune and stuff like that. Um, and that's where we just started working together on kind of a weekly basis, and then it just grew up. But it was, it was some, some people are, I told you to manage your own career aggressively, which you should do. It's very good advice, I promise. I'm not great at it, but something I, some people are incredibly good at politics, navigating an organization, da da da. That's not my strong suit. Thankfully, I've been blessed to like, have happy accidents that worked out well, but that's kind of how I did it, if that makes sense. I know that's not super helpful. <laughs> Follow the model of having accidental encounters that lead to great things. <laughs> Other questions? Okay, well, thank you so much, Mike. I really appreciate it. That good to